Hi, welcome back to the Local Food Summit. In this session, I'm going to be talking with Jordan Rubin. Jordan is a real advocate for the healthiest food that we can find. It was healthy food that healed him from a very serious illness when he was 19 years old. So it's been his passion to find a way to provide some of the healthiest food, and so he's been doing that for 20 years now. After this interview, I will go into more detail about what we are actually doing on his farm to heal the soil so that we can grow some of the healthiest food on the planet. I hope you enjoy this. So that's the premise of the Local Food Summit, is that it's important and imperative that we move it forward, that we find a way to do healthy food. So um, bringing you in felt like it was a perfect fit because you've already had this passion. And I'm curious, where did this passion come from for you? What is what is interest? What is it of so interest to you that you feel like food is so important? Well, I have been a real food advocate since I myself was uh, crippled with an illness, and this was 23 years ago. I grew up in a health conscious home. My dad's a chiropractor and a naturopathic doctor, but I did not truly understand the power of food till after failing 69 times to get well from incurable Crohn's disease, it was largely diet that saw me become whole again. And it wasn't just any type of food, but it was food that has a fragile distribution system. Think about raw dairy products and unpasteurized juices and grass-fed meats. And really, in 1996, I realized how difficult it was to get the foods then seemed like raw dairy was legal in California, but then it was illegal and medical milk board was coming against them. So I had a lot of stress when I found what worked for me that I'd be able to continue to consume it. And so I made a commitment really of what would be now 21, 22 years ago that one day I would raise and grow my own food so that I could sustain my health and then provide these foods for others that would be inspired by what I've gone through in my testimony to themselves get turned on to this. And so that that's really where my understanding and appreciation of food came from. I, so for me, in the last 22 years, I've been on a quest to not only locate some of the world's healthiest foods, but connect people with them and educate on how to best use these foods in your daily life, whether you want to overcome an illness or be the healthiest you you can be. Yeah. Well, then talk a little bit about how you ended up buying the farm and um, kind of what your vision was when you bought it and what your vision might be today. In 2008, I was on a six-month tour around America. I was recording a TV program, promoting a book. It was called Perfect Weight America. And a lot of this tour took us miles and miles. I think we traveled hundreds of thousands, but I was somewhere in between Iowa and Nebraska and I was in awe of all the windmills. So many people listening probably know right where that is. And I also was really captivated by the fields of green, but then I wasn't. And it seemed like in a moment I was confronted with the reality, the ugly truth of genetically modified monocrop agriculture and what looked beautiful and green from a distance was actually going to steal our children and our grandchildren's future. And I didn't know a lot about farming or agriculture, but I knew that this is not the way things should be. And at that moment, I just felt led to be somebody who spent a portion of my life growing and raising, collecting providing resources for others. In the Bible, um, you would call someone a Joseph, somebody who prepared for a disaster while storing up food and provisions during the times of plenty. And really, that was in mid-2008, and I made plans at that point to begin some semblance of a regenerative agriculture movement within my own life and my family. And so you, you found a piece of land uh, and you didn't buy 20 acres. 
Yeah, we, uh, we, we don't do things small around here, but we <laughs> looked in multiple states with various criteria, including large plots of land that were either organic or had not been sprayed or fertilized. So the, the it, organic was important to us. It's not the end all be all, but we wanted to make sure that we adhered to the most important and stringent standards that exist today for our agricultural practices. And so we found that between Tennessee and Oklahoma and Kansas and Texas and Missouri, that uh, areas of Missouri would provide land. A lot of it was not sprayed or tampered with, exposed to chemicals. There were live springs, which was also important. And the neighbors were not practicing conventional, genetically modified, driven agriculture. And, you know, sometimes you do something when you have a very small window of understanding and you look back and say, why did I do that? You know, I'm not as much concerned, Bill, why we bought thousands of acres in South Central Missouri. And when people ask me, why did you do this? I don't want to look back at the circumstances that drove me to, to start. I want to look forward to the solution that we're going to provide. And that is simply food, clothing, shelter, hydration and protection for people. Because I just believe we're going to need it. The bottom line is, if you look back thousands of years, the only things that were valuable then are the only true things that were value, that are valuable today. Our ancestors would scoff at us if they thought that we paid for everything with a piece of plastic using money we don't own to buy something from someone else that doesn't own what they're selling us. So to me, what's real? What can you step on? What can you feed with, hydrate with, shelter and protect? Obviously, that's grandiose and uh, nonspecific, but that really drove me. And now, all these years later, I'm trying to look at the resources that I currently have, not figure out why I have them, but use what I have to the best of my ability with the God-given resources and maximize abundance and efficiency. And hey, whether you've got a backyard, a potted plant, or 4,000 acres in South Central Missouri, we all need to do that. And I'm, I suspect many people watching today don't have a clue where to start. That's a good point. So, I mean, the thing that uh, comes up for me oftentimes in, in looking at um, where we're at today, where we need to be, I'm wondering how far away the tipping point is. Where's that point where, and what do you suppose will, uh, what, what has to happen before the majority of the population wakes up and says, oh my gosh, food really is our best medicine. I mean, some people are forced into it, like yourself. But there's still people who've been very sick and say, still don't realize that their health comes from really great food, you know, and a low stress, stress life. The real food revolution has begun. I mean, if you look back 30 years ago, health food stores were cobwebs, uh, people that had never used deodorant within a year's time, dreadlocks, tattoos, and I don't have a problem with dreadlocks, tattoos, or not using deodorant, but, but people did not want to go to these weird back alley places. Today, health food stores are mainstream. I just read yesterday that Leonardo DiCaprio is investing in another health company, a chickpea a chip, a garbanzo bean chip. Point being, it's arrived. The common culture has embraced natural, organic, chiropractic, acupuncture, food is good medicine. The tipping point is there. However, a much, much smaller group of people think about realize or understand that someone had to grow it. And I joke all the time, you can complain about the price of organic raspberries in the winter all you want, but I'd shell out six bucks for a clamshell half pint of raspberries much sooner than I would try to grow raspberries from a little stump that brings pests and insects and weather and early freezes and it's a bargain. The fact that we can buy organic food for the prices we can, it's too cheap. The whole system is messed up. But all that to say, the realization 
of how fragile our food supply is that most grocery stores have 16 hours worth of food, some even less if they're in Manhattan, for example, that if widespread power outages occurred, water outages, we would be up a dry creek without a paddle. That type of stuff comes and goes with the Y2Ks of the world and various elections, so to speak. But there's a much slower adoption of people that are interested not just in criticizing people for abusing the environment, but actually willing to go out and make a stand. Now, we know those people. We're exposed to those people. That movement's growing. But right now, people know food is good. It's our job to teach them how to find food sources that contribute to the environment and its health and how to participate yourself, who to buy from, what you can do, because anybody who can afford it can go buy a bunch of organic products from your local health food store or grocery. But I would argue that you are barely part of the solution. There's a much deeper discussion to be had than simply organic. That's why we've used the term quite often beyond organic. Right. Well, so that brings us, you know, to this uh, question of um, you have um, 4,000 acres or we're working together on 4,000 acres down in Missouri. Has your vision for that changed? And is there anything you you could share right now about where you feel like you would like to go with the uh, property that we're working on? Are you asking if my vision's changed since yesterday, uh, this morning, or um, the, let's just say that the vision has been evolving and I know so little, Bill, about what I would like to have in terms of knowledge and wisdom regarding agriculture, the environment. Really, our nation was founded on an agrarian lifestyle and every day I'm learning more. It's, it's a light bulb moment. And so absolutely, my vision has evolved probably most significantly since mid-April. So we're talking about six weeks. In the last six weeks, I've had this major download, and I like to call it a vision of how we can take our 4,000 acres in its various forms and turn it into a literal Garden of Eden. Now, mind you, we're in Koshkanong, Missouri. That's Native American for I'm still not sure where I am. We're not talking (laughs) about um, beautiful hills of Tennessee. We're not talking about Vermont. We're not talking about Illinois, where topsoil is uh, as popular as the Cubs these days. We're talking about a place where people grow rocks, depressed economy, and a general lack of excitement towards regenerative agriculture. So what we want to do in a number of years is create 3,000 acres of permanent orchards that require less work every year, provide more food every year, satisfy all palates and all diets. What I'm trying to say there is a mixed agriculture, omnivorous, beyond organic diet where each system feeds each other and every decade fertility grows along with it, of course, water holding capacity, a better ability to use the sun, the wind, and the rain. And here's the amazing part because many people are in the regenerative ag movement, many people who are in the climate change uh, discussion, they don't want to talk about money. They, they think that businesses have destroyed our planet. I, I won't argue with them, but here's the bottom line, Bill. The vision that I have can create the wholesale value in today's numbers of $100 million a year of food. Now, I want to say this. That's $100 million that I could sell or give away, right? There's nothing wrong with putting a dollar figure there. But imagine taking an acre and creating $33,300 worth of value every year. But best of all, the inputs don't grow. The soil doesn't become depleted. The soil builds, the inputs decrease, and Yeah, there's great amount of jobs for all kinds of people. In fact, we would employ more people in the county than even exist. How great is that? And and at the end of the day, Bill, I'm a dreamer. So will exactly what I'm saying today happen? Probably not. But I know for a fact I'll never reach a goal if I don't set one. (laughs) Well, well said, Jordan. 
So let's say you understand this is the uh, um, local food summit. Um, do you have any thoughts that you would like to share? Uh, and to you, you'll be speaking to thousands of people here. Do you have any thoughts you'd like to share about food, about local food, about uh, the relationship we might have with food? You know, Bill, there are an estimated 95 plus percent of people who want to know where their food comes from. And I can't tell you that the farmer's market movement is 100 percent gospel truth, the way to transform local communities. But it's certainly an easy way to start. If somebody's watching and says, yeah, this sounds great. I don't have any land. I don't even know where my pitchfork is. And my thumb isn't green. Right. Well, by the way, I know exactly where you stand. Um, (laughs) Go to a farmer's market. I can tell you in South Florida, where I grew up, I visited in the winter and I went to the farmer's market. It's about five times better than it was. More organic, unsprayed products, a more diverse offering of herbs and spices. There was outside grown, indoor grown. It was awesome. And it's some of the best times we have. There's an I'm right here in Tennessee where I'm located now, an amazing farmer's market with more local meat products and dairy and herbs and spices and veggies than I've seen in a lot of places. You don't have to be in Santa Monica or San Francisco to engage. And guess what? You go to those markets and you find out that these farmers also allow you to come to the farm. They have drop-off points. So we get our food from a multitude of places. Certainly health food stores are a primary, but We buy from local farmers who collect from other farmers. We bring food from our own farm. We visit farmer's markets. We're going to Hawaii for a vacation here very soon. And one of our excursions is to go to an organic farm. And another one is to go to a farmer's market. Am I changing Hawaii's soil? Am I transforming their local food movement? Not really, but I'm voting with my dollar and I'm doing something, right? I can choose where I eat. I can go to restaurants that offer farm to table. I can go to health food stores that cater to a local vendor of food. I can go to farmer's markets. I can find CSAs. I think people, because they can't go and buy land and farm, they decide to do nothing. You can absolutely do something. Your vote with your dollar matters much more than voting on a ballot or any type of legislation ever can. We will change the food culture. We will end genetically modified organisms. We will stop artificial sweeteners from being able to be publicized as diet foods. We can do it by how we shop and who we partner with. And I think, you know, journey to a, uh, to a, a thousand miles starts with one step, right? So that's the step that I think people can take. And it's really awesome to engage your family in the the conversation and and relationship with local food purveyors it's a pretty awesome thing oh, thank you thanks for that jordan you know in our permaculture design courses that's one of the things we tell our students is you know you vote with your dollar and when you go to when we go to a fast food restaurant that buys through the industrial system we're telling them continue to abuse animals continue to uh you know spray herbicides and pesticides on the land Whereas if we take that same dollar, we find a local restaurant or somebody who is actually buying food from the local farmer who is building topsoil. When we buy that food, we are building topsoil. We are healing the land. We are supporting the economy of a farmer who's taking care of the land and our local economy as well. And we're improving our health. It's, it's just A, B, C, D. It just stacks up beautifully. So. And I heard one of my kids say recently, Preparing your own food is awesome. Preparing your own food that you've grown is beyond awesome. And many of us in Generation X and those behind us, the millennials, they just don't know that food comes from a farm. They think food comes from a grocery store. It's the concrete jungle syndrome. And we're, we're at a really amazing crossroads. We can still tip this thing the right way. Um, pointing fingers shouting climate change, talking about polar bears. I'm telling you because I'm somebody that that does not get my attention. That does not uh, boycotting oil companies, uh, trying to say that everybody needs to live off solar power when that technology is not affordable. That doesn't move me. What moves me is 
grow your own food or buy from someone who does and get an orange that's riper so it has more vitamin C and compost the peel so that we can turn it into more soil. Uh, it, you don't have to live in a very big place to compost. I moved to California still having my property in Missouri and I composted using food scraps, a blender, and a rented yard. When I say rented, I was renting the house and I thought, you know what? Gosh darn, I'm gonna leave this place better than when I came. It might smell worse, but it'll be better. <laughs> so um, it literally made compost in my blender and poured it outside. It certainly condensed and I gave it to a neighbor when I left and hopefully he used it to grow something, right? So um, start doing something. Don't wait till you're retired. Don't wait till you have the right job. Don't wait till you can afford it. Every dollar you spend on your health and on the environment, which is really a twofer, will be worth multitudes of dollars later. Well, Jordan, thank you for your time and thank you for being such a strong visionary for, uh, for what's possible in the future. It's, uh, it's important that we have people like you, many others who are speaking during this summit, are talking about what's really possible. So thanks for doing that, and thanks for uh, leading the charge. It's been great to be here. Thanks for having me, Bill. You bet, Jordan. Take care. Becky and I have had a fortunate opportunity to work with Jordan over the last two and a half years. He contacted us and uh, said he had a large, a decent-sized farm down in Missouri. Didn't say exactly how big. He says he's looking at 320 acres and would like some assistance in seeing what would it take to take care of that land, to improve it. He's, his goal is, his goals are pretty noble. They're pretty, um, pretty expansive as well. Let me sh explain to you what the farm looks like and what we've been doing thus far. So we'll bring up to speed so you know what's going on when he and I are talking. Here's a, a picture uh, of the farm, an aerial photograph of the farm. It's actually about 4,000 acres. I didn't know it was that big till I got down there. But the acreage that he wants to work on is the 320 acres in the upper left-hand corner. We're located in south central Missouri. Uh, there's Jordan with uh, two of his children. Um, he gets to the farm as often as he can, but he lives in Nashville at this time. So uh, when I get down there, he comes up, and uh, he and I and Kevin Keplinger, his farm manager, uh, are working on this long-term design along with other uh, assistance on the farm by local uh, employees as well as some interns that are working with us, students of ours. The interesting thing about this in Missouri, this is uh, 47 inches of annual rainfall. So for those of you who live in the southwest or any area where water is scarce, this is not the problem here. And not only does it get 47 inches a year there, but they get some every single month. So it's a really perfect situation for rainfall. But interestingly enough, we're still having challenges growing pasture, just putting pastures in. And there's a good reason for this. It has to do with the tightness of the soils. So um, just to give you an example, we, um, we're beginning with this uh, half square mile that you can see here on the slide. Uh, those are 10 foot contour lines. So you can see there's quite a few hills and valleys on the property, and there's still some woods on this property. When we start on a new piece of property, what we're looking for is what the percolation rate is on the land. If water is soaking into the ground, then we know we have the ability to grow more and more plants because there'll be the water that's necessary there. But if water isn't able to percolate, then we're gonna know we have the opposite challenge. And they were having challenges with these pastures, so I automatically suspected that the, water, the soils are gonna be pretty tight and the percolation rates are rather slow. So Jordan's goal for the farm is pretty simple. It's to build the healthiest soil and food on the planet. That's why he's calling it Heal the Planet Farm. He wants to see what is possible, and if we can do it, he wants to demonstrate to the world or to others how it can be done. We want the farm to become a living example of what is possible in the way of growing healthy food and healthy soils. So the first thing would be to hold more water, and we knew we needed to hold more water because we did a percolation test. In a percolation test, the simplest form of it is to dig a hole that's about 12 inches in diameter, uh, fill it full of water, drive a stake in there, mark the stake uh, every inch on the stake, and set your stopwatch. Uh, you fill the hole up almost to the top to one of those lines, you come back exactly an hour later, you measure the amount of water that has soaked into the ground, and that tells you approximately 
how much water that landscape can hold per hour. A good percolation rate is between four and even up to eight inches an hour. Some of the most lush pastures out there can do that. Prairies could have probably held more like 12 to 14 inches of rainfall per hour. But on Jordan's farm, unfortunately, the soils are very tight. There's very little life in the soil. We were only able to get one third of an inch of percolation per hour, 0.33 inches per hour. So we knew right away we had to do something about that. But there was another reason that we wanted to hold water on the landscape. And it has to do with the uh, serious uh, flooding and potential droughts. We don't have to worry too much about droughts in Missouri, although there can be some very dry periods, in which case um, the pastures actually experience a drought. If it doesn't rain for one to two weeks, the pastures can get so dry that grasses start turning brown. Even though we had a lot of rain, it's not soaking into the ground. But the other challenge is when the water doesn't soak into the ground, then we have the problem with flooding. And just last month, I was down at the farm, and I was there for one of the record floods that they've had down there. Um, there was flooding the communities, cars were rolling down the street. Uh, it was pretty amazing. Uh, in this picture here down on the farm, this is where the river meets the farm. Uh, you can see I put a, a line there where the water levels were. We came down there to look at it, and whereas normally it's just a quiet little a river that runs through there. Uh, it looked like um, the Mississippi River to us. Um, we could barely see the opposite side of the bank. It was it was easily um, two football fields uh, wide in, in length. Uh, that would be 600 feet uh, wide. So what was normally a 14, 18 foot creek is now a 600 foot uh, river. And uh, not only did it move a lot of water and move a lot of trash, it dumped, here's a picture of one of the pastures with um, about uh, eight inches of gravel on top of it. The pasture is still under there, the grass and the soil, everything's there in this case, but about eight inches of gravel was dumped on the property. So one of the reasons that we can say that we can experience more flooding around the United States as well as around the planet is the intention, when as, as nature creates plant life, more and more water soaks into the ground. And when we disturb that plant life by either tilling the soil on a regular basis or putting up communities or parking lots, that water no longer can percolate down into the soil. And when that happens, we change the water tables. Rivers and creeks drop in the summertime because there's not enough water percolating down through the soil to maintain those. And when the rains do come, most of the water falls off right now. And when that happens, we have more and more serious flooding. So we're seeing this all over the planet, and certainly the case in the Ozarks. There's a lot of stone. Uh, the percolation rates are relatively poor all over the Ozarks. And if we can figure out a way to hold more water and give it time to percolate down, we can minimize um, uh, probably 70 to 80 percent of the flooding that, go, that goes on in these environments. But it takes a, a large concerted effort. But that's Jordan's commitment. Just to give you an example of how much water runs off the property, in a one-inch rain on this 320 acres, that comes to about 9 million gallons of water that runs into the creeks and the rivers. And that's just one inch on this 320 acres. The farm is 4,000 acres, which means we have about 100 million gallons of water or run off the farm in just a one-inch rain. When we were down there for all that flooding, we had about eight inches of rain. So you can see that would be 800 million gallons of water we contributed to the flooding because we weren't able to hold a lot of that. Now, there are three ways that we're holding water on the farm, or the three ways that we're approaching this. The first one is to cut swales in on contour. Swale is a water harvesting ditch on contour, and I'll show you that in a second. The second way is to use a key line plow. This doesn't turn the soil, but it creates slices in the soil and little channels underneath the sod. And if they're cut on contour, they become these little ditches or these little, you might say, terraces, underground terraces on the landscape that can hold massive amounts of water. And then the third way we're holding water on the landscape is by planting in and growing deeper and deeper and deeper pastures. The, uh, here's a picture of a swale. This is a recently cut swale. You can see it's not perfectly straight. It's going to follow the contour line. A swale is a water harvesting ditch cut on contour. There's a great video, I'll link you to that video here, it's uh, by Jeff Lawton, but he shows how a swale, it only captures excess water, water that's running over the surface, 
that swale will capture some of that. And because its swale is perfectly level, water doesn't go left, it doesn't go right, it literally just slowly backs up and fills that swale, giving it time to soak in. So when the rain stops, these swales can be full of water, and over the next day or two days, depending on the percolation rates of the soil, that water slowly soaks into the ground. And over time, if you look at this next slide, you can see over time you actually build up a bank of water in the soils. If you have the right kind of soils, you have the right amount of silt or clay content that will hold water, it will hold that water for years. So anything you plant downhill from a swale, once those deep roots get down, it will have access to water that it wouldn't have anywhere else on the landscape. And uh, this area, once it's charged, it would, it'll take anywhere from three to eight years maybe to charge the subsoil. But once it's charged, those deep-rooted plants, whether they be trees, shrubs, or other kinds of plants, prairie plants, they will be into the, into the deep water. And if there was a drought, they wouldn't know it for two, three, or four years because they've got water. So this is the, the principle behind it. A lot of times these uh, uh, swales are cut with an excavator. This is one of the common methods that you'll see if you go online and look for videos on cutting swales. This is a project that we did over in Ohio. Uh, this is cutting the swales in March, and here's a picture of me at the exact same location uh, the following August. So you can see, you once you seed them in, get your plants in, you can see they'll, they'll hold quite a bit of water. But um, I'm explaining this to uh, Kevin Keplinger. He's the farm manager down at the Peel the Planet Farm. And uh, he said, well, Bill, I think uh, if, as long as we don't have to make them so deep, uh, we can make them any size we want, really. A swale doesn't have to be any particular size. It's just how much time and money do you have? Anything you do to slow water down, give it time to rest and sink in is an advantage. And he says, we don't have time to take an excavator all over 320 acres. Right now we're planning on putting in about 15 miles of swale. But he said, I've got a really good blade on the back of my tractor. Let me drop that down and see if I can't cut a swale with the blade. And so that's what we did. Here's a picture of Kevin. Uh, and you can see this is the second or third pass, and he's already down about 12 inches, creating a berm on the downhill side. And it worked. Um, me and uh, one of my other... Uh, interns. Uh, we mar spent four hours marking about uh, two or three miles worth of swales, and Kevin came out and cut them all in about an hour and a half. So it was pretty uh, exciting to see this, and now we've cut, um, I think we have about six miles of swales on the farm now. I'll show you a picture here in a minute of some of the earlier ones we cut. And all, all we do is we go in and we mark. We take a, uh, a laser level, we put in flags, we mark the contour line, and then he comes in, drops the plow, and just basically follows these little flags that we put in the ground. And um, he makes usually about three or four passes. In this slide here, you can see uh, it had rained the day before. One day later, there's still water in this swale, and you can see how it's holding water and how it's soaking in. So now you multiply this times rain after rainfall, and you put a, a whole series of these moving down the landscape, and you can see right off the bat, you're going to hold quite a bit of water. This is the conceptual design of the swales and some of the ponds when I first met with Jordan and Kevin, uh, just to give them an example of how a swale would follow the contour line and that we could set ponds, not just in the valleys, but we could set ponds out on ridges that tend to be really dry. We could put ponds anywhere along a swale system and that swale just moves that water because they're perfectly level. And um, it's not hard to design, it's not hard to do, it just takes a little bit of time and practice. But these are the swales, this picture here are the swales that we put in the, the first big trip I went down there. This is about three miles of swales. And since then we put another two or three miles in. But uh, every time they uh, it rains and they fill up, we're capturing about 180,000 gallons of water. And if they fill up, you know, four or five times a year, you're talking about already a million gallons of water that we're holding that we weren't holding before. So this is a really good start. The other thing that the swales do now, they've marked contour on the landscape, which now gives us the opportunity to bring in another piece of equipment, which is called the key line plow. P.A. Yeomans was a gentleman from Australia who uh, spent years helping uh, improve farms. In their situation in Australia, they would have anywhere from 12 to 18 inches of rainfall per year, one-third or one-fourth the amount of rain that Jordan gets on his farm in Missouri. And so figuring out a way to capture that water on tight soils. 
he started with a, what's called a subsoil plow and ran that on contour. And every time it rained, that, that cut in the ground needs to fill up with water. Now, it's not disturbing the top of the soil, hardly at all. What it's doing is creating a slice in the soil on contour, so when water shows up, that water can go down to the bottom of that contour, bottom of that cut, work its way back up and move down to the next cut, and down to the next cut. Here's a, um, a picture of before and after key lining. On the right, you can see the soil is slightly disturbed, but you can see there's a lot of ridges and a lot of um, up and down uh, in there. And each one of those acts as a mini swale. So by running the key line plow through the property, through the land, that in itself can change our percolation rates from a third of an inch per hour to two to three inches per hour. It's massive, the amount of water this key lining will do. Now, since we're just putting a slice in, uh, with weathering and more rain, certainly with freezing and thawing, those slices close up. And so you key line maybe two, three, or four times. This is how we use the contour lines. Uh, we are, if, the, if we've already cut the swales in, we use the contour lines to guide the tractor pulling the key line plow. The fork is an example of maybe a four bottom key line plow. You start at the top of the swale, work your way around, and then you keep working up to the next swale. Then you come around and start on top of the next swale above that. This way, you're always taking water from the valley and moving it towards the ridge, which is the driest part of the landscape. This shows the different slices. This number one shows you a pasture that's been grazed on a regular basis. When you do set grazing or when you put livestock in a pen and just let them come around and keep nibbling, the, the plants grow a little bit and then they get eaten down. They grow a little bit, they get eaten down. They grow a bit, they get eaten down. The same thing happens with the roots. The roots start to expand, but when the top of the plant goes, they shrink back. So they expand and shrink, expand and shrink. There's this process going on constantly when the livestock can come along and keep nibbling on young plants. But if we can keep the livestock off for a while and allow the plants to get taller, then the roots get taller as well. And then taller and taller more, finally to the point where if you can get pastures that are three or four feet high in, um, in forage on top of the ground, you can be sure you have a, quite a massive amount of roots down below. And the roots help pull water down into the soil. So the key lining, you start by dropping the key line plow in two, three, four inches below the sod layer, seeding behind it. The next year, or actually you could do that in the spring and then even in the summer if you have constant rainfall, you could come in again, offset the key line plow, go down two or three inches now further, seeding behind that, getting alfalfa, deep-rooted plants to grow as an example. And then early fall, you could come in and key line a third time or the next year, and seed in behind that once again deeper and you can see how quickly in a period of two you know one to three years you can develop a fairly thick pasture pretty quickly but every time you key line you only drop the key line down uh, two to three inches below the sod layer you make that cut seed in behind it and allow those roots to go down and use that water and then the next time you come in you offset go a little deeper and why do we want roots in the ground? This is an example of some common prairie plants found around the Midwest. And you can see the variation in the root, root structure. But it's, it's, it's real easy to see. You can go up to almost any kind of an environment and where the grass is short, pour water on the ground and water starts to spread. But if you go over next to a bush where there's a deep root system and pour water on the same ground, but now by a bush, the water gets soaked into the ground. That's the nature of roots. They keep the soil open. They create pathways for other kinds of life, for worms, and when the water shows up, those roots it gives the water a pathway to follow the roots down and go into the soil. Deep roots are one of the best ways to heal soil. So that's the plan that we have down at the farm, those three methods, which is swales, key lining, and deep pastures. Uh, here's a picture of Jordan with uh, one of our students who's helped out on the farm for a while. Uh, David, uh, and this is the cedar. You can see the ground is kind of rough in front of Jordan and David. That ground was key lined about two or three weeks before, and now they're coming through with the cedar and planting the seed in behind with some deep-rooted prairie plants. So um, this slide here will link you to some of these uh, videos that we've done that will explain this in a lot more in detail. If you have 30 minutes, 
the uh, video of the clay model goes into quite a bit of detail on how we move water on the landscape, where we put ponds, where you might locate your house. It's, um, it's about two hours worth of permaculture design course stuck into a 30 minute demonstration. So if you have the time, I recommend it. The other three videos, the tractor cutting on a swale, the key line plow in motion, and the hugo culture swale are all about two to three minutes in length.